Emil, thank you so much for this conversation tonight. Thank you. To start this off, tell us a bit about yourself. Where are you from? And how did you come to be at the University of Washington in the late 60s? Okay, before I go there, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd like to uh, say that I was, I'm just one of the BSU members. And there were people who led the effort even more so than me. And there are a few that, who are here tonight, and I, I would like for them to stand. BSU founders. So I'm going to mention their names. Uh, please don't applaud again. Uh, Larry Gossett, Carmelita Lattisa Atkins, Marcy Hall McMurtry, Carl Miller, Carl Miller. Uh, I must say that um, it, was, it was others too, and I'll, I'll, I'll name a few of them, a few of my uh, other favorite people. Eddie Demings, Verlaine Keith Miller, Kathy Halley, Eddie Ray Walker, Gary Owens, and Aaron Dixon. So these are some of the folks. There are others, but these um, individuals also contributed to whatever I'm going to tell you tonight. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge them and to say I represent not only what they did, but also um, the uh, archival research that I've done and also interacting with um, the, the different individuals. There are other people I, I would like to acknowledge as well. And the next one is, uh, you know, Barack calls Michelle his rock? Yes. Well, I have a foundation. <laughs> and that foundation is Barbara oh. and Petrie. <laughs> I've, I've been at this for as long as we've been together. And she's sacrificed a lot. All the times I spent working with students, helping students, all the time I spent advising BSU, and sometimes they listen to my advice. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that. But you know, I've learned that uh, we have six boys, so you tell them what they need to know, and eventually they'll get it. And so. I don't, it doesn't bother me that they don't heed my advice right away. Another person who has been really uh, a great supporter and has really taught me how to do archival research, uh, has done a lot of it for me, has edited everything I've written, uh, and all of this free of charge. At least they pay me 15 hours a week, but she does it for free. And that's Antoinette Wills. And one of the reasons why I'm still working and I'm here tonight is after I retired, the person who named me the elder statesman uh, in 2008 when we celebrated our 40th anniversary, she said, we need to do a book. We need to tell the true story because people make up stories all the time. <laughs> so two months after I retired, she brought me back. And one of my uh, roles was to lead an effort to write a book about the history of minority affairs and diversity. And that is <laughs> Sheila Edwards Lang. Thank you so much, <laughs> Sheila. OK, let's move on to 19th. Uh, I, I, made a, I made a big <laughs> mistake. Oh, no. oh, OK. He's sitting Go right ahead. up here. He's sitting right up here, too, in a cowboy hat. And he used to be a bull rider. He was. Jesse Jesus, to let you know his ethnicity, Jesus Crowder uh, was also one of the founding members of the Black Student Union. <laughs> the, 
the Black Student Union of 1968, as far as we know, was the only black student union that had non-black people in it. And when we talk about the demands, the letter, you see that their group was represented. And I'm really proud of the BSU and the effort they took to make sure that it wasn't about just about black people. It was about what we call third world people, people who had been oppressed and exploited uh, for all their lives. And we wanted to make sure that um, we represented them too. And so they are uh, distinguished members of this group and we really appreciate them. And uh, there are a couple who are former vice presidents. And one of them came all the way from New Mexico to be here tonight. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely be remiss if I didn't acknowledge her. And I've also said that if uh, she hadn't promoted me, I'd probably still be working. I wouldn't have been able to retire. So I owe a debt of gratitude to Rusty Barcelo. Thank you. Rusty. OK, so I'll quickly uh, tell about myself. There's been so much written, the Collar Magazine and, and other um, publications that you probably know a bit about me. But I, uh, I came to the University of Washington. I grew up in Louisiana, uh, went to uh, segregated schools from the first through college. Uh, and one of the reasons why I chose to come to the of Seattle and the University of Washington is uh, they said that race relations were great here. And I liked the, the geography. I'd gone to San Francisco, and I liked the way it looked. And they said, yeah, that's a great place to be. I'd, I'd, I was admitted to a few different schools, NYU, City University of New York, University of Kansas, Purdue. Um, but I chose to come here. Also, they, uh, the TA ship was more, but I didn't realize the cost of living would negate that. Uh, so I came here. And um, the first quarter I was here, I was walking across campus, and they called me the N-word. And that just changed everything about this place. And um, I didn't like the way I was treated growing up in the segregated South. And I think it was good that I left, because my, my life may have been shortened, because I was never going to take that abuse and disrespect from anyone. Um, and then I went to the hub, looking for black people, because I had been around black people all my life, all the schools. And I found two tables in the hub. Right when you walk into the cafeteria, they had the black tables. And uh, I met Carl Miller and Eddie Walker and Eddie Demings. Um, and so and I, I was invited to. Um, a meeting, and it was Afro-American Student Society. And I started attending those meeting, meetings, and um, once the group went to San, uh, Los Angeles at the Black Youth Conference and really got inspired, um, it, things started to happen. I just want to say, too, that um, in the civil, we talk about uh, during that period what led people to do what they did. And they would say that was the Vietnam War and that was the Civil Rights Movement. Um, but SCLC was doing something different. Um, and the person who came and was one of the leaders uh, of the, the group was E.J. Brisker. And another was uh, Carl Miller. And the, there was one person who was in the sit-in who was at San Francisco State. And the one common connection with all these men was SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. All right. And um, it was from what Stokely was talking about and from um, the uh, attitude about self-determination, about knowing your history and, and not being um, lured into integration. And Stokely said that, you know, Integration without power was useless. And what integration was really going to do was um, take away your cultural integrity. And so 
Uh, so for me, the BSU, it wasn't inspiration. Malcolm X was another inspiration. But the, you know, the Vietnam movement, that was, another, that was another different story. What the Vietnam move, movement did, though, is, is brought supporters to the, the black campus movement because Students for a Democratic Society, uh, the Vietnam Committee, uh, w supported BSU, and uh, there was a lot of, you know, they, they supported the rallies and was there for BSU. So I give the credit to SNCC. That's the, for me, that's the genesis. And I've had discussions with Carl about it. He's been my, uh, my main consultant. And uh, he, he said something different, but I still will stay with SNCC <laughs> because SNCC is what inspired us, along with Malcolm X and I had uh, uh, went to a, a speech by Stokely Carmichael and that really, when I was in undergraduate school. And I went to Southern University. And at that time, the person who succeeded SNCC was a student. And his name was H. Rap Brown. And I love to, to read rap. You know, that's, rap is an old thing. And the rappers just borrowed it, but people have been talking what they call talking trash for many years. So anyway, okay. let's move on. Okay, so moving on to 1968, <laughs> what demands were issued? <laughs> what demands were issued to UW leadership by the Black Student Union, and why did the BSU decide to take the next step and yeah. occupy Gerberdine Hall? Yeah. Um, so I'm prefacing everything they asked me, and I knew this was coming, but then that the militancy in me and all of that makes me not just follow the script. Jeanette, <laughs> right on. So I've been a photographer for the graduate school lecture. And for uh, when I went to the Sammy E. Kelly lecture, um, Professor Banks was talking about different types of citizens. He mentioned the failed citizen, and those are people from the oppressed groups, the recognized citizens, the one who have all the privileges, and then the transformative citizen, the ones who know, who care, and who act. So that really resonated with me, and that's what the BSU was about. The BSU knew that there were not enough non-white students on this campus. Eddie Deming said when he came here, um, he knew it was going to be different. He came from Cleveland High School, but he didn't know it was going to be that way. He said, after all, my parents are taxpayers, but yet I see nobody who looks like me. Um, Marcy Hall and Carmelita um, Latticer said the same thing. So, so did Jesus. And so something needed to be done about it. But the other issue was uh, when you did go to class, there was you know, there was nothing about your history. There's nothing about what your people did, what your culture uh, had to offer. And if students needed to know about it, they had to go outside. Um, so, and another thing that really resonated with me in the letter, and the BSU introduced the demands. They didn't just say, here are the five demands. We want you to act on them. There was an introduction. And part of that introduction was that um, when white students go to class and they see all white people running everything, they get a sense of superiority. All right. And when non-white students see the same thing, they get a feeling of inferiority. So how are you going to go out in the world and represent you when you think you're inferior? Um, so that, to me, is what set the, the mood for the demands. And the first demand was no decisions, no plans um, should be done uh, that, that about black students should be done without the consulting with the Black Student Union. And that's another, for me, that's another SNCC influence. You know, we determine our destiny, no one else. The next was to provide resources and aid to tutor 
and train non-white students. Um, and the third was to, well, in addition to, there was an add-on that there were 200 Afro-American students, 20 American Indians, and 10 Mexican Americans. Those were estimates. Um, and what the BSU demanded was 300 Afro-Americans, 200 American Indians, and 100 um, Mexican Americans. That's what they were called at the time. But we call Mexican Americans Chicanos. So I'm just, you know, giving back what was in the, um, in the letter. And the next was to improve the representation of black teachers, black um, administrators, and black staff. Um, and there were black uh, staff, but they were mostly in semi-skilled jobs. And we wanted the, the representation to be um, greater than that. And the last one was to hire two um, African-American in the music department, jazz. It's, you know, black people invented jazz. They taught it by Negro spirituals, but no black people in the music department. And Joe Bazile was an accomplished musician. He played on John Coltrane's album called Home. He was a saxophonist and played uh, with Roy Ayers' Ubiquity. So these were qualified people, and those were the demands of BSU. Thank you for that. Five, um, <laughs> well, you said what led to the, Terry's yeah, watching Jeanette two. probably. To the BSU, to the, to the BSU occupying Gerberdine Hall. Yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that, that led to it. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank well, you. So, okay, so moving on in terms of the actions that were supported by the allies and other multi ethnic okay. cultural organizations, tell us a little bit about the organization that played a role in, in what is, has founded OMAD. Well, Marcy, Jesus, Carmelita were, were the four people of those groups that were um, organized. Um, the American Indian Student Association was organized in 1969. Um, UMAS started out in 68, became Mecha in 1969. Then there was the Asian Coalition for Equality. These groups um, were part of of influencing how OMA was organized, especially um, the uh, Asian Coalition for Equality. Because when the special education program was established, the Asian students were left out. And a year later, uh, Larry Matsuda, Tony Ogilvie, and Woody Wong um, protested with Dr. Charles Evans, who was the director of special education, to include Filipinos and needy Asians. And at that protest was Larry Gossett and Carl Miller supporting that effort. Um, so uh, those, that's how we had all the different groups. And, uh, and Filipinos are part of the legacy in and I insisted with Ricky that they have to be a part of EOP because they, they were there from the beginning, regardless of whether um, the representation had changed. So those are the groups that contributed to OMA. And when Sam Kelly came and organized it, he had those different uh, student uh, divisions, the Black Student Division, the Chicano Student Division, the American Indian Student Division, and the Asian and Poverty Student Division. And Sam Kelly selected to be the supervisors, activists, Larry Gossett, uh, Mike Castellano for the Asian Division, Emmett Oliver, who I think protested at San Quentin in San Francisco, um, and the uh, and Sam Martinez from the Latino 
So those were the groups that Sam Kelly organized, and that's how it went from there. Thank you. So next, can you share with us, what do you see as the most important OMAD milestones under the vice presidents who served in the 90s and the 2000s? So in the 90s, there was one vice president. He had, actually he went, he went to 2001. That was Myron Apilato. And Myron said uh, as soon as he took the job, he was at a Board of Regents meeting, and the Regents said, we're going to get rid of that program because you guys are not graduating your students. And uh, students were being graduated, but there were three different admission groups, group one, group two, group three. Now, the group threes were, had 2.0, less than 2.0s, but they got in through special admissions. And I think when they did the research to make their case, it was the, the group threes. Other, the group ones were regular admits. They were just a part of EOP. And they were doing, you know, fairly well, um, but still much lower than the regular uh, the student body. Uh, so Myron, his, his, uh, that, that inspired him to, to, to get busy on working to uh, improve um, the retention and graduation rates. And one of the, the things he did was to establish a bridge program for the most at-risk students, and that happened in 1995, and it came about uh, because the athletic department wanted to have a bridge program. In 1978, they had proposed a bridge program, program, but they couldn't get any money for it. So, but when the athletes wanted to have one, I think the NCAA rules were that you had to have non-athletes. So, OMA got lucky and became a part of that. And those students um, did, did fairly well. And as one um, who's related to Millie Russell, he came here with a 2.6 GPA out of Garfield with, I think, 1030 SAT. And he wanted to be an engineer, a computer engineer, an electrical engineer. And he, he got busy. Um, but there was a student that we had who was a tutor that was doing very well acing almost every test. And this kid ended up getting admitted to electrical engineering and computer engineering. And, and he used the IC regularly, and we asked him, why, why did you do so well with you know, starting out where you were? And uh, he said, because I want to be like the person, Lauren, for you guys to brag about me the way you bragged about Lauren. And Lauren Murray, uh, if you were at the uh, event last night, there's a Murray Petrie Rose Bow Baker Scholarship. And Lauren Murray is now is a, is a cardiologist, but he inspired a student who would not have gotten in if it wasn't for OMA, and now who is, has a master's degree in computer science from the University of Illinois and is working in a startup company. So those are, you know, they, had the, they, they didn't have the credentials but they had high potential, and that's what that's the reason. That's one of the things that Myron did that was useful. Also, during that period, the first study abroad program was introduced, the Rome uh, program, and students still go to Rome, and that was uh, 1995. Um, and also during that period, um, the instruction center began to get lo a lot more support. And they started hiring more uh, uh, instructors, more tutors. I uh, became the director in 1990. Now, that's when it really took off. <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 it bore fruit. Um, in 2001, the Instructional Center won the Brotman Award for Instructional Excellence and the Brotman Award for Diversity. The first time a minority program had been recognized by the University of Washington, and the first time that a, a, a program that wasn't a part of an academic department received an award from the Teaching Academy. That was really, a, really a great day. And Myron was really um, behind the IC, and he used to promote us all the time and say that we were the flagship. And then the other division in OMA would say, what about us? and give him grief. Um, but I might add that a, a 
a vice provost from the University of Michigan came to visit our uh, center and wrote a letter saying that it was a jewel in the crown of the University of Washington and a model for all higher education to follow. So I've been trying to get him to add that jewel in the crown to the <laughs> name ever since. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you touched on this just a little bit by uh, speaking about Lauren. So we know that you are a numbers guy, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But let's talk about other uh, prominent alumni who have benefited from OMAD programs and services throughout the years. So can you name a couple others who have? Yeah, there's one other, and he's here. And I saw him last night, and I was hoping that he would, he would come to the event. And when we interviewed him, we, um, the library provided the transcribers. But Antoinette was so excited about his story that she volunteered to transcribe his audio. And his name is Rogelio Riojas. And I know most of you know that he's a member of the Board of Regents. And uh, Rogelio told us a story about coming from a family of 14. 12 children, and they would start picking cotton in Texas. Then they would go to Othello and do the sugar beets. Then they would go up to the Skagit Valley and do strawberries. Then down to Turlock, California and do peaches and grapes and oranges. Then sometimes they would stop off in Arizona and pick cotton and back to Texas, April to November. And they did that until Rogelio was 14 years old. And they decided to settle in Othello, Washington. And that's where he went to school. And he said that he had no idea that he could get into the University of Washington. But there were some Chicano tutors they were, it was announced on the radio, come to the library and talk to these recruiters. And he said he really liked what they were saying. They were very articulate, articulate, and he said he decided to come here. And he said he had a 2.6 GPA, and I said, well, you could get in uh, through regular admissions. And he said, well, I didn't know that. He said the only person he knew that went to UW had a 4.0. So he thought that's the only way he could get in. But he came, um, he got a couple of degrees, he is now um, president and CEO of a multi-million dollar health care program. And it didn't stop there. His organization gives $200,000 scholarships to students each year to support them. Now that's one very good reason why we have the Office of Minority Affairs and the Fabulous Thank you. And he has children that's gone through the program. He has a son who is a partner in a law firm, and they all uh, took advantage of advising, um, instructional center, and the, uh, what is now the Samuel Kelly Ethnic Culture Center. It's really a family of programs. Uh, another one you probably heard about is Nelson Del Rio. Nelson Del Rio didn't even finish high school. He dropped out, got a GED. <coughs> And someone told him that you could go to college, come to the Minority Affairs, they can get you in. So Nelson came. Um, in 83, he won the Vice President's Achievement Award. In 84, he was a co-winner of the President's Achievement Award. Graduated magna cum laude, not thank you laude. <laughs> um, <laughs> went to... <laughs> Went to Harvard Law School and worked on Wall Street. Now he's a multimillionaire. And last night, you heard this, the uh, Global Citizen Award. He, he, that's his endowment. He also has endowments in the College of the Environment. And um, without OMAD, that opportunity wouldn't have been available. Um, so he's another great um, case. And the co-winner with him 
was Gary Holden. He was from the economic, uh, economically uh, disadvantaged student division of OMAD. That was the white group. And OMAD, um, since, at least since 69, has had white students in its program. So it's called Minority Affairs, but it's not about ethnicity. It's about the actual, what minor, minor means in mathematics, not the majority. And, um, and he's now, he went to Columbia, got a PhD, um, and he teaches in the uh, new NYU um, School of Social Work. And when I was looking through on the internet at his resume, he still has listed winner of the Vice President mm -hmm. Achievement Award. Not Vice President, President's Achievement Award. He's still proud of that until this day. So those are some of the few people. And I have a list of, I've been compiling for the book. I started with 50. We was going to call it the Fantastical 50 mm -hmm. after the Stevie Wonder uh, <laughs> term. Uh, but, but I'm up to like 120 now, so I don't know what Because there's been such outstanding folks. Um, Annie Young Scribner is now the CEO of Godiva Chocolate. She went to Kent Meridian High School, was an EOP student. So those are some of the outstanding people that we are proud to have uh, provided services to. Okay, thank you. So the later part of your career in OMAD found you primarily in assessment, and we know that you really dug deep into the data and numbers. Yes. Can you please share what were some of your most significant findings? Okay, <clears throat> so I have a, a few slides, and uh, they told me that, um, that um, you know, make it so lay people could, uh, could read it. And so I got numbers, I mean, I got lines, and I got graphs, and, uh, and, she, and Sheila would know that I used to say this, and Russ is going to get on my case for saying it. Uh, but I said, I tried to make it so Stevie wouldn't have to wonder. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, so as, you, as you can see here, um, we, we, we break it out by minorities because that was one of the BS you wanted more minorities. So we graphed to show minorities how that's increased over the years. Then we have EOP in the... Uh, in the green to show how that's you know kind of up and down and then underrepresented minorities so you see how the how the trend goes so and um they put in a plug here for larry in the early uh in 74 there were more black students in eop than any other group and there were undergrad there were 1217 and that number didn't get surpassed until this year uh, that's if you don't count two or more races, so like 1266. Um, so one of the things that when I, when I saw that and I saw that peak was as Larry had him doing it. Um, and then as you can see, it goes up and down. Uh, here in 96-98 um, in uh, was getting up close to when the I-200 was passed. And once I-200 was passed, we we had 40% declines in entering incoming underrepresented students. So it took, it took a dip. Um, in 1997, um, UW went to, from a two-tier system, because we had EOP admissions, and then we had regular admissions. And so the two, uh, we, they would come through different streams. Uh, but in 1997, uh, after the Hopwood case in 1995, Enrique Morales and um, Tim Washburn got together and said, we probably need to go to a one-tier system. Even during that one-tier system, you could, uh, you could use race as a factor. Uh, and it went up until 99. And after that, we took a dip. Uh, but then, as you can see, it started to go up. But at the same time, in the green uh, line, it started to go up sooner. And the reason that happened was Another idea that Enrique and Tim had was to affiliate those students who were EOP in the past and who would be coming in with um, characteristics similar to EOP. And we knew that they uh, had lower SAT scores, lower grades, but could get in through regular admissions. 
So we came up with an affiliated program, so, and they were called the EOP-1. So from that time, it started to go up. We affiliated based on underrepresentedness, um, socioeconomic status, and first generation status. And so that's, that's the show, that, so it's been going up um, ever since. The other reason for the underrepresented minorities going up um, so high is the, the Latino group has been growing um, uh, exponentially almost for, for a lot of years. So that, that accounts for that trend. Uh, the next one I'll just show you quickly to show what happened during the time OMA was founded. You see the gap between the, the, regular, uh, the student body and the graduation rates. It was high, high as 30 points, but it's been steadily closing over the years. So a part of that has to do with admissions. It has to do with the support that um, OMAD programs provide. And I uh, have always said that we're going to take credit when, it's, when we're doing well, because if it, if it was failing, we'd have to take that credit. So we're taking credit. And, and we're, we're proud of that. But you know, there's still a gap, but we, we make it headway. This, uh, graph shows uh, degrees earned over the years, starting back in 1970 forward. And as you can see, the minority group is steadily going up. The OP leveled off, increasing slightly, leveled off, and now it's, it's, on, the, it's on the way up too. Um, and so when you add that all up together, you get 28,000 EOP students who have earned degrees um, since the beginning of the program. There's another 6,000 who use the IC and the Counseling Center who graduated from the program. So you could add 34,000. If you really want to see the impact that the Black Student Union had on those numbers, if you look at minority students, over 65,000 have earned degrees since 1968. So, that's the end of my uh, lecture. <laughs> <laughs> my wife likes to watch uh, Henry Louis Gates' <clears throat> a series on African Americans, and all she likes the genealogy thing too. <clears throat> and I was listening one day, and Henry Louis Gates said, and he was talking about the movement of black people, and he said, how could we have come so far and still have so far to go? And that's the next 50. We still have far to go. Um, if you look at the percentage of college-age students in the state based on the 1960s, I think 19, uh, 2020, 2010 census, it's uh, around 22% in the state. But we have around 14% who are enrolled, underrepresented students who enroll. So that's one gap. And another thing about it is um, it's projected that um, it's going to increase by 30%, or 50% underrepresented students. So you already have this eight percentage point gap. So if we're not here to continue to recruit and to close that, you know, to work to close the gap, so we still need that to happen. If you look at the graduation <laughs> rates, there's still a gap. Um, and if, if you look at, uh, I have another slide I'd like to show you here. Um, this slide shows median income by race. There's another gap when you look at, when you look at um, the uh, students earning degrees in STEM. And I just talked to June, and we, we're making great strides. There's a program that Sheila helped start in 2008, and it's gone from 4% of uh, STEM degree earners who are URM to now 8%. So it has doubled, and that's what NSF required. So it has doubled, but we still, um, if you look at the student body, if you're 14%, you still got a gap. And if you look at these, it, and STEM degree earners will help close the uh, income gap. 
And if you look at that, you see you have, there's a pretty wide gap. Um, for Hispanic, Latino, if Roberto was alive, he'd really be raising cane about that. Mm -hmm. American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, they're all around 40,000, 42,000. The average is uh, 59,000. The average for um, white is 62,000. And the average for Asian Americans is 71,000. You got a huge wealth gap. And to close that gap, you're gonna, we're gonna need to, to produce more graduates in STEM because that's where the, 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 big, the big dollars are. So that's another <laughs> a, a gap we have, a wealth gap. And if we look at the, um, what we call the gateway courses, there's an academic performance gap. And those are still the challenges that we have before us. And I say it, it is the responsibility. We say, and Sheila was big on saying that, it is the responsibility of the university to do something about it. But I believe, we believe, that OMAD should lead the way. After all, we have 50 years of experience at helping students who have been challenged to be successful. And so those are, are the challenges. That's the 50 next that Vice President Hall talks about. And if you look at degree attainment, we, we got serious gaps there. So those are the things that still need to be done. So that's the steal so far we have to go. Thank you. So before we open it up for audience questions, please share with us, what is your favorite OMAD moment? Well, I've already said it was when I see one of those two awards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But the other one, too, and I didn't say uh, anything about Sheila's era, and Sheila uh, really, she inspired me to get the numbers because Sheila made the case. She used that to make the case for our existence, our continued existence, and also the case for um, the need to improve. And um, those are things that, with Sheila at the helm, and Rusty started it. And we look at the pyramid, the pyramid, Ricky, that was Rusty's idea to do that pyramid back in 2003, 2004. So I want to give them their due because they made a huge difference. In addition to Sheila getting the, uh, the uh, Samuel Kelly Center remodel, Waslabot built, and um, the, great, the um, endowments, the OMAD's endowment has gone from 11 in 2000 to now we're up to close to 38, and that, that market value is over $4 million. That's higher than some HBCUs, at least comparable. So those are the things that Sheila did and was behind, and, and Rusty uh, and Rusty started the, the, the big 300000 the $100,000 raised at Celebration, and has now grown to over 300000 Rusty brought on an advancement person. We never had an advancement person before that. Rusty brought that person on. So they are taking it, what Sam Kelly started, and taking it to another level. And that's what we still need to continue to do. Thank you. Well, Emil, this has been truly a gift yes. of you capturing 50 years of history in 90 minutes. Thank so you. I can't Appreciate think of anyone you. better who would have been able to share this history with us. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we would just like to thank you for your decades of contributions to the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. Thank you.